Okay, now we can share the screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. It is. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So, um, first, let us discuss what do we have here in this first paper. Now, this paper is common for all the subjects, be it English, be it uh, history, be it education, sociology, or the science subjects, anything. This paper is common for everyone. Everyone has to attend this paper. So we will now start discussing what's there in this paper. This paper, uh, first let me, uh, let me uh, tell this, that the entire exam is of 300 marks. And there are 150 questions. The first paper will have 50 questions, each carrying two marks and the second paper will have 100 questions each carrying two marks there is no negative marking for paper one and paper two both the papers they do not have any negative marking so that's something positive so our objective should be to attend each and every question okay so um having been clear about this our next um, topic of discussion would be what's there in paper one. So I have uh, listed down the topics that are there in paper one. They are teaching aptitude, research aptitude, mathematical reasoning, logical reasoning, English comprehension, data interpretation, information and communication technology, and communication higher education and people and environment so these are roughly the topics that we have to cover for paper one now for the division of marks as i have said that this section will contain 50 questions and as you can see there are some nine to ten subtopics so it is um, it is quite safe to assume that each part each subsection will have five to six questions let's say for teaching aptitude you will have like five to six six questions same about research aptitude now for some sections the number of questions are fixed for example the sections of english comprehension and data interpretation both of these sections will have five questions each so five questions for English comprehension and five questions for data interpretation, each carrying two marks. Now, these are the two cases where you can definitely score full marks, 20 out of 20, 10 marks from English comprehension, 10 marks from data interpretation. I repeat, these are the sections where you can score full marks. And I will show you how you can do that quite effectively and efficiently without wasting much time but that for another day today our topic of discussion will be limited to teaching aptitude so let's get started so these are the subsections of the section of teaching aptitude what do we have to learn in this section we have to understand a few concepts objectives of teaching several levels of teaching like memory level understanding level and reflective level some learner characteristics including academic social emotional and cognitive characteristics then we will also have to know about certain factors that affect teaching the procedure of teaching teacher learner the materials that are needed as support for teaching certain instructional facilities learning environment institutions all of these are factors that affect teaching then we will move forward discussing certain methods of teaching like teacher-centered and learner-centered methods offline versus online methods 
Swayam, Swayam Prabha and MOOCs. These three terms are extremely important. Before the beginning of the session, let me tell all of you that these three terms, Swayam, Swayam Prabha and MOOC, these terms are extremely important. And there is a high chance that questions will definitely come from one of these three sections, three, three terms. Then we will move forward to uh, the differences between traditional and modern teaching and ICT based teaching. And at the end, we will talk about the several types of evaluation, the CBCS method, that is the choice best credit system and the CBT, that is computer based testing. So these are broadly the things that we would try to cover in this session. But let me tell you beforehand that maybe not all of these uh, topics will be covered in this session because um, for obvious reasons, exam is knocking at our door. So we will limit ourselves to the topics that are extremely important and from where the probability of questions appearing are higher. So let's get started. If there is any question, please note them down and ask me at the end of the class i will definitely address each and every question even after that if someone has forgotten to ask a question or some question appears later while revising the entire thing you can personally ask me on whatsapp every one of you have my whatsapp contact you can definitely ask me and alongside with that this video will be uploaded to youtube you can uh, type down your queries in the comment section as well. So, first of all, before starting, we should, before starting the rest of the things regarding, uh, relating to teaching aptitude, related to teaching aptitude, we should talk about certain important teaching definitions. Now, these definitions are important because questions will come like this, like a definition will be given and there will be four options. Who in the, who uh, gave this definition? There will be four names. So it is important that we not only know about the definitions, but also know the names of the people who have given these definitions. The first definition that we have is by H.C. Morrison. This is a definition of teaching. And what is the definition? Teaching is intimate contact between the more mature personality and a less mature one. So what does Morrison want to say is that the teacher is a more mature personality, someone with apparently more knowledge, who is disseminating their knowledge to someone who is less mature in order to make that person more mature. Then we have the definition of Jackson. Give me a second. Then we have the definition of Jackson. Jackson says that teaching is a face-to-face -face encounter between two or more persons, one of whom intends to affect certain changes in the other participants. So this definition is quite similar to the first one, just a little bit elaboration, we might say. The second definition is by Jackson. The third definition is by J.B. Howe and James K. Duncan. They say that teaching is an activity with four phases, a curriculum planning phase, an instructing phase, and an evaluating phase. This definition presents the organizational aspects by which we can describe and analyze the teaching process. So these people have, uh, uh, have labeled out some phases, curriculum, phase, planning phase, instructing phase, and evaluating phase. So um, we should remember all of these, the names of these phases, because a question might come from them. The next definition is by N. L. Gage. The democratic point of view is that teaching is interpersonal influence aimed at changing the behavior of behavior potential of another person. So what is teaching? Teaching is the interpersonal influence aimed at changing the behavior potential of another person. So everyone has certain codes and patterns of behavior. So what teaching does is that they influence to change certain potential behavioral patterns and direct them towards certain 
positive patterns. Lastly, we have the definition by Clerk, who says that teaching refers to activities that are designed and performed to produce in students' behavior. So the last, both of the last two definitions focus on the behavioral pattern of students that are changed by the influence of the teacher through certain activities. So the last two definitions can be confusing. Please um, make sure that you know the distinctions. Um, clerk refers to activities. Gage refers to influences. OK, so please uh, mind these uh, very, uh, very small distinctions. Otherwise, you might get confused if certain questions come in your exam. So some concepts regarding education. These are informative, and you have to remember them. The concept of basic education, that is Vardha education system. The proponent was Mahatma Gandhi. The proponent of the Vardha education system, the basic education, was Mahatma Gandhi. The second concept of education, learning to take place in nature and from nature. The proponent of this theory was Rabindranath Tagore. Um, some of you might know, some of you are from Viswavarati University. Now, the entire concept of Viswavarati University was um, the entire foundation of Viswavarati University was based on these con this particular concept, this learning to take place in nature and from nature, where human beings should be able to learn directly from nature under the guidance of, um, of an instructor. Then we have the concept of integral education. The proponent was Sri Aurobindo, Rishi Aurobindo Ghosh. Next, we have focus on spiritual aspects of Indian philosophy, Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. After that, we have education to transform human mind. The proponent of this concept is J. Krishnamurti. Then we have experimental learning by John Dewey, self-education through development of individuality by Maria Montessori, kindergarten focus on self-activity, creativeness, and social cooperation by Froebel, no formal learning, nature is only the only teacher, Rousseau. So as you can notice that the concepts that we have taken here that we have mentioned here, four are by Indian, for the proponents of four concepts are Indian, Indian people, and the rest of the four are um, foreigners. Among them, and the concept of Rousseau is uh, much more in alignment with Tagore. Um, the only difference is Rousseau focuses on the fact that there should be no formal learning. Nature is the only teacher, and human beings should be able to learn directly from nature itself. But Tagore, um, although taking this uh, concept from Rousseau, he focuses that there should be a kind of uh, formality. There should be a kind of formal space and under a proper instructor. Otherwise, the learners, uh, less the learners, can get um, wavered. The learners cannot understand what to learn and when to learn. <clears throat> now, next, we come to the objectives of teaching, or in other sense, the objective of education. The first objective, as mentioned here, is to help students acquire knowledge. So what is happening here, what we are trying to say is that the primary objective of teaching is to impart knowledge and wisdom. However, this knowledge thing is not merely limited to textbook knowledge. It is wider than it is wider and broader than that. The second objective is to shape the character and behavior of human beings. So as I have mentioned before, that teachers help students acquire knowledge. And this is more than what is included in textbooks or in our syllabus. The relationship between a teacher and the students should never be limited to syllabus and textbooks. It is beyond that. Because through the process of teaching, 
the character of the student is shaped and behavior is moduled and molded, as I have mentioned before in the previous slide of the concepts. Um, next objective is to foster the sense of independence. So every teacher helps students to be strong and independent. One of the main outcomes of effective education is independence and to foster a sense of having a strong foothold in the face of the society among the students. Another objective of teaching and education is to motivate students. This goes without saying, teachers have the capacity, the potential and the capability to fire intrinsic motivation in their students. And this actually helps students to be successful in life. If you ask any successful person about their secret to success, they will mention at least one teacher who has been very influential in their life. So here, what we understand is that the motivation thing, of course, it comes from friends and families, but the motivation thing, the amount of motivation the teacher can deliver to a student is unparalleled. Let's go on to the next slide. There are several forms of education, as I was talking a few moments ago about formal education while discussing the concepts of Rousseau and Rabindranath Tagore. Now, there are basically three forms of education, formal, informal, and non-formal. What is formal education? Formal education is pre-planned. It is direct, it is organized, and it is provided in specific educational institutions, such as schools, colleges, universities, and so on and so forth. It is limited to a specific period, and it has a well-defined curriculum. It is provided, it is guided, it is given by qualified and trained teachers. You will not find a teacher without a degree in schools or colleges mostly, uh, except for some exceptional cases, of course. Formal education observes strict discipline. Discipline is the key. Whenever we go to colleges or schools or universities, it is not our home. Even the kind of disciplines we practice at home, it is different from that which is practiced in educational institutions. There are codes of conducts, there are codes of dresses, there are codes of behaviors, there is a code for everything. So strict discipline is extremely important in the case of formal education. Formal education occurs at different levels. As we know in our education system, there are different levels such as primary education, secondary education, higher education, graduation, post-graduation, doctorate, post-doctorates. There are several levels of this education. And um, it is a step-by-step -step process. Now, talking about informal education, it is quite opposite, as the name suggests. It is quite the opposite of formal education. It is not pre-planned or deliberate. It is spontaneous and it is indirect. It takes place from day-to-day -day activities, experiences and living in family or community. Informal education is not limited to the barriers and walls of schools and colleges or other institutions. Informal education means learning from life, the practical experiences that we get from life. Here we have a name. The name is Pestalozzi, who believed that parents are the first informal teachers of every man or woman. Family environment is the first learning environment. Please note the name Pestalozzi, P-E-S-T-A-L-O-Z-Z-I. If you are unable to note, then not to worry. This is included in the note that 
<clears throat> I will share after the end of this class. So this is something similar to whatever a certain teacher used to say in my school life. So the teacher that I am talking about, he used to say this a lot of times while taking our classes is that parents are your first teachers and teachers are your second parents. Now, this is true to some extent about the second one. I'm not sure about the second one, but about the first one, I can definitely say that the first learning experience comes from the family. A child learns from its parents as they are their first educators. So informal education starts with the family and the environment of the family, and it expands itself to the environment of the society, the context, the background of every individual. Lastly, we have non-formal education. The examples of this education are let's say social education or adult education or distance education. These are certain examples of non-formal education. Moving on to the next slide. Now, there have been several important educational commissions after the independence of India because setting up a national educational policy was extremely important for an independent nation. I will mention some. First one was the University Education Commission of 1948. I will repeat, University Education Commission of 1948. This commission was chaired by Dr. S. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. Next comes the Secondary Education Commissions of 1952 to 53. It was chaired by Dr. Mullidhar. Dr. Mullidhar. After that, we have National Education Committee, which was set up under Dr. S. Radhakrishnan as its chairman. And lastly, one of the most important ones is that the Kothari Education Commission. I repeat the Kothari Education Commission of 1964 to 66. Finally, the National Educational Policy was set up in the year 1986. It specified the following aims and objectives of our education. Now, I would like everyone to note this and read this very carefully and remember this because there's a high chance that questions might come from this section of national educational policy. So what are the objectives and policy of our education? Number one, all round material and spiritual development of all people. The previous one, okay. The previous one, what I was talking about was certain important educational commissions. The first one was University Education Commission of 1948. The chairman was Dr. S. Radhakrishnan. Then comes Secondary Education Commissions of 1952 and 53. The chairman was Dr. Murlidhar. Then National Education Committee, S. Radhakrishnan as its chairman. And finally, Kothari Education Commission of 1964 and 66. If you miss something, not to worry. I will share the notes. Everything is there. And also, this video has been recorded. It will be uploaded to my YouTube channel. I'll share the link. And anyone who is not able to join right now or has to leave early, not to worry, not to be anxious. They can easily follow up by watching the video once again. So as I was discussing, the aims and objectives of our education according to the National Educational Policy of 1986. Number one, all round material and spiritual development of all people. Now we are living in an age uh, of materialism, of capitalism. So the concept of material development is important whether we like it or not and since india is an extremely spiritual country the spiritual development is also important for people next comes the cultural orientation and development of interest in indian culture now hundreds of years of uh, maybe 200 years of colonial um, rule has rendered us 
a lack of interest in our own culture. The colonial hangover is a term that has been used many times to describe uh, the sense of um, imitation of foreigners. So our education policy aims at the cultural orientation and development of interest in our culture, the Indian culture. Indian culture is very rich and throughout history it has uh, proved to be one of the oldest of civilizations and one of the most tenacious ones and tolerant ones. Next we have scientific temper. Without a proper scientific temper, advancement in technology and science is impossible. National cohesion. It's important that we all identify as um, Indians, no matter our caste, creed, race, religion, color, and so on and so forth. So for this, a proper education is important. Independence of mind and spirit, furthering the goals of socialism, secularism, and democracy. All of these terms are included in our constitution. So understanding and cultivating in ourselves uh, these terms, the cultivation of these terms in ourselves as individual and as collective is important. Manpower development for different levels of economy, fostering research in all areas of development, education for equality. So these are the aims and objectives of our education according to the National Educational Policy of 1986. I will request everyone to go through this very carefully and remember this because questions um, might come from these sections. Next, we will talk about the different levels of teaching. There are three levels basically, MLT, ULT and RLT. MLT refers to memory level of teaching. ULT refers to understanding level of teaching. And RLT refers to reflective level of teaching. So first, we come to the MLT or memory level of teaching. Memory level teaching emphasizes on presentation of facts and information. Knowledge or information is gained by the learner through memorizing. It is the initial stage of teaching and it induces the habit of ROTE learning of facts and subject matters. Basically, this is about memorizing. Hmm. Uh, give me a second. Yeah. <laughs> It covers only the knowledge-based objectives of Bloom's taxonomy. Now, I'm not discussing about Bloom's taxonomy in this session because it's not about teaching, it's about learning. I'll talk about Bloom's taxonomy in a different video. I'll try to. Um, it's, uh, it's a different model, actually. Just know this, that um, MLT, or memory level of teaching, covers only the knowledge-based objectives of Bloom's taxonomy. At this level, the student learns to identify, recall, or remember the objects, events, and ideas, and retain them in their memory. In this, sec in this level, the teacher plays a very kind of, what should, what should I say, a very authoritarian kind of role. Because the teacher has to be completely in control. Because in this level, the learner is so immature that they cannot think for themselves themselves the only evaluation system in this level includes oral written and essay type examinations the role of teacher in this level is very prominent and the role of student is quite secondary and also very passive this level of teaching does not improve intelligence and increases students' capability but this is required for other level of teaching. This is absolutely basic level of teaching. And without going through this level of teaching, the other levels cannot be reached. Although this level is very primitive, and as mentioned, that this does not improve and increase the student's intelligence or capacities or capabilities of critical thinking, let's say. But still, this level is important because without retention, without proper retention of facts and things, it is impossible for a student to reach the next levels. There is a theory, the Herbertian theory, H-E-R-T-I-A-N. The Herbertian theory, yes, the Herbertian theory of 
<clears throat> the Herbertian theory supports that young children's mind is ready for perceiving themselves and the world around them. The young mind is always ready for acquiring factual information, which includes concepts, elements, structures, models, even theories. They can acquire and retain information about a large number of things. As we have seen that certain children have more capacity to memorize than adults. Why? Because they are in their initial phase of learning. And in this phase, their mind is like a blank slate and everything is being written there. So their memory, their mind and memory is not clogged up and cramped by the things that adults have crammed up their memory with and mind with. That is why they have higher capacity of memorizing. And this initial phase of teaching, memory level teaching, serves a very important role in their emotional and intellectual development. We will talk about the classification of memory. There are several kinds of memories. The first one is immediate memory. Whenever a recalling, whenever recalling anything is immediate, then we have permanent memory. That is the recalling of material for a longer time. Suppose I have had an experience in my childhood and I can recall it even to this day. So that is a permanent memory. Personal memory is recalling experiences. So we all have had experiences in the past. And based on that, we um, judge and determine our next uh, goals and objectives. Impersonal memories is the information that we retain from books and companions. Active memory is making the effort to recall past experiences, like recalling answers in an exam. Passive memory is recalling experience without much effort, like the like let's say the act of swimming or riding a bicycle. These are examples of passive memory. That is why it is said that once you learn to swim or ride a bicycle, you can never forget. Because that is what we recall without much effort. That is a part of our passive memory. Then we have mechanical or physical memory. The body becoming habitual of doing any task repeatedly. Suppose I am, um, suppose I am uh, learning to write. So initially, I will have problems. Initially, I will hold the pen or the pencil very carefully and um, write each letter one by one to form a word. But with practice, I can do it without much effort. It is same about learning an instrument. Suppose I'm learning to play the guitar. Initially, my hands will strain. But as our, as our muscle will retain the entire memory of how the guitar is played, it is not much of an effort. Then we have rote memory, cramming facts without understanding. It is just mugging of things without much understanding. The things we do at the last moment before our exams. <laughs> and lastly, we have logical memory to learn something by using intellect and recalling when needed. Logical memory is very important for our survival. Next, we come to ULT or understanding level of teaching. Now, Morrison has divided the understanding level of teaching into five steps. The first step is exploration, testing previous knowledge and analyzing the content. OK, before discussing Morrison's uh, uh, steps, I should talk about a little bit about understanding level of teaching. Now, memory level teaching is the prerequisite for the understanding level. Without going through the MLT, the stage of ULT cannot be reached. This stage helps to build the thinking level of students to make use of their acquired knowledge based on previously known facts and subjects. In this stage, the teacher explains to the student the relationships between principles and facts, and the teacher also teaches them how these principles can be applied so memory, although serving as an important factor even in this stage, this stage 
is more focused on the application of the things that they have learned in the MLT stage. This stage focuses on the mastery of a particular subject. It provides more and more opportunity for the students to develop the skills of insight. Now, insight is not good enough if it is not complemented by memory. So it is better to say that this stage is all about memory and insight collided together, collaborated together. The evaluation system in this stage is mainly objective type questions and also critical essays about understanding. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> Students and teachers both play very active roles in this level of teaching. So in MLT, what happened, teacher only played the dominant role. It was completely controlled by the teacher. But in this stage, the, here we find a kind of participation from both the teacher and the student. OK. Now, coming to Morrison's division, Morrison, Morrison divides the stage into five steps, exploration, presentation, assimilation, organization, and recitation. Exploration is the testing of previous knowledge and the ability to analyze the content of the things that they have retained through their memory. Presentation is the delivery of the content, how it is presented, how it is diagnosed, how it is recapitulated, uh, uh, till the students understand. Then we have assimilation, that is the generalization, the individual activities like working in laboratory or in library. If a student works in a laboratory or in the library, they should be able to distinguish between the kind of knowledge they are searching for or and the kind of knowledge that is not needed at the present time. So here what we find the learner is a little bit more mature as mentioned before. Then comes organization. Peoples are provided with occasions for representation. So after presentation, here we have representation. So students are actively involved in this process, in this step of teaching. Finally, recitation, where the student is able to uh, deliver the content orally. Hmm? Next uh, comes the reflective level of teaching. Now. Reflect, ref, reflecting on something, this means giving some careful thoughts to something over time, like contemplating, thinking deeply. This stage talks about both understanding level and memory level teaching. The main objective of this stage is to develop problem solving skills, critical and constructive behavior, independent and original thoughts. At this level, the emphasis is laid on identifying a particular problem, defining it, and finding a proper solution to that problem. The student's original thinking and creative abilities developed significantly at this stage. Sorry. Hmm. A student is active and primary in this stage while the teacher becomes secondary and passive. In this stage, as uh, we can see on the screen, this stage of teaching, um, Hunt, Hunt is the main proponent of this uh, stage of teaching. As mentioned before, it includes both ULT and MLT. This is problem-centered teaching. And students are assumed to adopt some sort of, some sort of research approach to solve the problem. It's like when a student is writing a dissertation or a thesis, for example, a master's dissertation or an MPhil or PhD thesis. Hunt developed this model of teaching, which goes through the various steps, including creating a problematic situation, formulate and verify the hypothesis, data analysis, and testing the hypothesis around the problem. The main process of evaluation in this stage of learning is mostly essay type tests. OK, there is no stage, no uh, scope for objective type questions in this stage of teaching. The main mode of evaluation is essay type answers. The teaching at this level is not teacher centric. 
it is not subject centric it is completely learner centric okay so having discussed the three stages of teaching now we will move forward to discuss the two models of teaching there are several models no model can be termed as a perfect one but nevertheless we have two models the first one is pedagogical model and the second one is andragogical model now pedagogy is a conventional approach in this method the instructor controls the material to be learned and the pace of learning also while presenting the course contents to the students the purpose of this method of learning is to acquire and memorize new knowledge or learn new skills this type of approach is known as pedagogical approach <laughs> next we have the andragogical model and here the learner is not directly directed by any teacher the learner is mostly self-directed and is responsible for their own learning the students learn best not only by receiving knowledge but also through the interpretation of that particular knowledge learning that is the learning through epiphanies and discoveries and at the same time setting the pace of their own learning for example <laughs> suppose you are reading let's say a novel let's say you are reading a novel now you have read several interpretations by your own and now you are developing your own interpretation of that novel now that novel is not in your syllabus and no teacher has asked you to read that whatever you are doing that you are doing out of your own sense of curiosity and thirst for knowledge so here you are following the andragogical model because here you are self-directed and you are controlling the pace of your study of your education <laughs> next um, we will move forward to um, the teacher centric education and the learner centric education in the teacher centric education the teacher casts himself or herself in the role of being a master in a particular subject the teacher is looked upon by the learners as an expert or as an authoritarian figure we have talked about this in the previous models also but this is a specific description of the two types of education the examples of such methods are expository or lecture methods suppose a teacher is delivering a lecture in a classroom situation that is a teacher centric education quite opposed to that <coughs> learner centric education the teacher in, in the learner centered education the teacher is both a teacher and a learner at the same time suppose i am discussing something to you like let's say for example this class even this class is a learner centered education because i am telling something to you people and in the process i am also going through the process of learning so um the teacher also learns in this process the teacher also learns new things every day which they did not know in the process of teaching the teacher becomes a resource rather than an authority rather than becoming an authoritative figure the teacher becomes a resource which the students can use the the uh, what can i say the, the bank of knowledge through which the student can take can can borrow something examples of this learner centered methods are discussion methods let's say um, the discussion that happens with a phd scholar and mm, their supervisor now let's come to the three very important um, okay there are several uh, before discussing swayam swayam prava and mu because let me um, tell you that there are several benefits and drawbacks of both the teacher centric and the learner centric models that are included in the notes so i will not i am not going to discuss this in this class because obviously because the short span of time i'll share the notes you can see them 
there in the notes if it will be available. Also, I will be sharing this PPT for your convenience in case that you have missed anything. Uh, so um, now we will um, go forward to the three terms, three very important terms, Swayam, Swayam Prabha and MOOC. So Swayam, the full form of Swayam is study waves of active learning for young aspiring minds. I will repeat, study waves of active learning for young aspiring minds. This was launched on 9th July 2017. I repeat, this was launched on 9th July 2017 by the Ministry of Human Resource Development in order to provide one integrated platform and portal for online courses. This covers all higher education subjects and skill sector courses. The objective is to ensure that every student in this country has access to the best quality higher education at an affordable cost. Academicians from hundreds of institutions throughout the country are involved in developing and delivering massive on open online courses. I repeat, massive open online courses or MOOCs, M-O-O-C-S, through Swayam in almost all the disciplines from senior schooling to post-graduation. Now, Swayam Prava is also an initiative of the Ministry of HRD or Human Resource Development to provide 32 high quality educational channels. The number is 32. 32 high quality educational channels through DTH across the length and breadth of the country on a 24 into 7 basis. This has a curriculum based course content covering diverse disciplines. And this is primarily aimed at making quality learning resources accessible to remote areas where internet availability is still a challenge. As you can understand, not every place on earth on, in our country has proper access to internet, but there are televisions. So through the DTH, um, this effort of Swayam Prava does the same as it is done through Swayam. Just rather than doing it on the platform of the internet, they are using the DTH for this, uh, for this initiative. The DTH channels are using the GSAT-15 satellite for program telecasts. I repeat, GSAT-15 satellite. This is the name of the satellite that the channels are using for the program telecasts. Lastly, MOOC, M-O-O-C, Massive Open Online Courses. This is an online course aimed at unlimited participation and open access via the internet. Sorry. Yeah, so as I was discussing, this is an online MOOC is an online course aimed at unlimited participation and open access via internet. In addition to traditional course materials, such as um, pre-recorded lectures, readings, and problem sets, many MOOCs provide interactive user forums to support community interactions between students, teachers, professors, and teaching assistants. MOOCs are very recent, and they are widely researched development in distance education. It was first introduced in 2008 as a popular mode of learning, and it emerged as a popular mode of learning in the year 2012. So it was first introduced in distance education in 2008, and it emerged as a very popular mode of learning in 2012. Early MOOCs often emphasized open access features, such as open licensing of content, structure, and learning goals to promote the reuse and remixing of resources. <clears throat> Next. Uh, some merits and demerits of traditional teaching methods. Um, so um, first of all, let me talk about what are traditional methods of teaching. Traditional teaching approach is a back to the basics kind of methodology of teaching. 
It is a teacher-centric approach, which means that this method sees the teacher as having indisputable authority. It concentrates more on memorizing and reinforcing techniques. In this method, in this um, traditional teaching method, the learner is seen as passive uh, recipient. The focus completely remains on the completion of syllabus and evaluation of learners through traditional examination systems. The teachers evaluate the learners, but there is no benchmark for evaluating the teachers. The common materials that are used here for the teaching in rural classrooms are textbooks and blackboards. Class management is all about maintaining discipline. And there is no emphasis on team building or cooperation or collaboration. And this method is usually lecture based. Now, some merits of this traditional teaching method is lecture remains one of the most effective teaching methods when a group of learners is exceptionally huge. If you are if you are having a class of let's say 100 or 150 people, the lecture, no matter how much we hate lectures, lecture remains one of the most effective teaching methods. Traditional teaching methods are easy to use given any group of learners. They're economic, and the teacher has a lot of authority over how the content is delivered and how much of creativity is involved. But there are several demerits. There is almost no involvement of the learner. There is less emphasis on the understanding of concepts. Weak learners suffer the most as they don't feel motivated or involved if there is a huge classroom, there is not much chance to provide um, importance, provide uh, focus on any particular student. So weak learners suffer very much. Evaluation of learners based on traditional teaching methods can sometimes be very faulty because it depends on person to person on how they evaluate. And there is less incentive among teachers for reflection. It is only about retention, not about reflection. Now, modern teaching methods, we should also talk about modern methods are more learner-centric rather than teacher-centric. More content can be covered in lesser time. Certain techniques are like, let's say, peer-assisted learning or brainstorming, group discussions, etc. This include ICT-enabled learning techniques through the use of computers, overhead projectors, videos, documentaries, whiteboards, and so on and so forth. ICT-enabled learning also incorporates mobile and internet-based learning methods. So um, the fact is that there is, in this method, the teaching and learning process becomes uh, more fun and interactive kind of activity. There is more scope for using audiovisual aids, like documentaries, YouTube videos, online lectures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is not a very mechanical way, and it is very interactive. Students can get involved, and it also helps the student for self-evaluation. But there are certain demerits as well, because since teaching becomes more dynamic, it is important for teachers to learn and relearn new skills, which is very challenging from the perspective of the teacher. Now, before this COVID and lockdown, um, let's say 70% or 80% of the senior teachers were not very fluent in this online mode of teaching. And they had to adapt to the new, new normal, the new reality very quickly, which was very, very difficult for the teachers. There is too much in this, in this modern teaching methodology, there is too much reliance on technology, which what happens as we have all seen several videos which have gone viral in Facebook and Instagram that the students are mocking, making fun of teachers in online classes because the teacher has uh, practically no authority. The maximum that the teacher can do is to um, remove the student. And that's that. There is nothing more that the teacher can do. So because the student is sitting in a safe space, the teacher can't physically access the student or see eye to eye with the student and tell them that whatever you are doing, you're not doing it right. They cannot tell them, facing them eye to eye, and say that this is not what you should be doing. So the authority of the teacher reduces significantly, and it requires humongous amount of investment of money, time, and effort. Like, for example, making these PPTs for teaching. All of the teachers present here, you know very well how much time it takes to make 
a PPT of only one hour lecture. So it is very time consuming. And also, you have to have a laptop or desktop to make PPTs and provide, uh, deliver content online. And some of the teaching methods are uh, very exclusionary in nature. They do not include everyone. They cannot include everyone because they are very specific. And the student-teacher relationship is, um, it, uh, it suffers the most. Because as we see, I have seen this personally, that the online batches who have recently qualified graduation, in our times, college was a place of belonging. But the online batches, they literally have no connection to college. Well, not all of them. I'm not generalizing. And they're saying that they themselves have sometimes admitted that, yes, we have no connection to college, let alone the teacher. Let alone the teacher. They are hearing from a person whom they have not seen physically, whom they have not seen, like they have not seen them eye to eye. They have not had a face to face conversation. So although this method, this modern teaching method can reach hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people at once from the distant corners of the world, but still there is something that it lacks. The relationship of the student teacher, the involvement, direct involvement of the learner and the instructor. And um, that is not very good. That is why even students nowadays are preferring offline mode of classes unless it is inevitable to take classes online. Lastly, we will talk about some um, types of evaluation before ending this session. There are um, several types of evaluation. The first one, uh, placement evaluation, prognostic evaluation, formative evaluation, diagnostic evaluation, summative evaluation, and portfolio evaluation. The final one, it is not showing for some reason. Yeah, it's showing now. <laughs> so let's take the first one, placement evaluation. This determines the knowledge and skills the student possesses. It is done at the beginning of the instruction in a particular subject area. The purpose, the primary purpose is to check the aptitude of a candidate for the course or subject whether the candidate has a caliber or not. For example, entrance exams, entrance examinations. Many of uh, you present here might be appearing for uh, the um, CUET. So that is an entrance examination. So that is the evaluation done there. It is a placement evaluation. Um, next, we have prognostic evaluation. It aims to predict the possible degree of success in a specific subject area. It helps to gather evidence related to conceptual understanding and other prerequisites still that are significant for success. Next, we have formative evaluation. This is also known as internal evaluation. I repeat, internal evaluation. It is used in the improvement of educational programs and for judging the worth of a program while the program activities are still in progress. It is done through continuously uh, throughout the course of the period, and it focuses on the process and quick feedbacks. The teacher here is less of an instructor and more of, let's say, a coach, a coach, yes. And for teachers, formative evaluation provides information for making instructions and remedies more effective. Diagnostic evaluation is closely related to formative evaluation as well. It tries to provide the explanation for the possible causes of problems in learning. Then we have summative evaluation, which is also known as external evaluation. Uh, it is usually done at the end of a course or program as we have external examinations, you know, uh, internals and externals. So this is done at the end of a course or a program. It involves formal testing of students, like uh, annual semester and exams, something like that. And the focus is on the outcome. This is also an outcome-based evaluation. Then um, we have finally um, portfolio evaluation or assessment. It takes place over a long period of time, 
the project, written assessment, tests, etc., the tools of this assessment. So, like dissertations, assignments, etc., these are uh, some portfolio evaluation uh, techniques, evaluation styles. And feedback to the learner is more formal and also provides it provides opportunities for learners to demonstrate their understanding after the feedback has been understood and acted upon. So um, that marks uh, the end of today's lecture on teaching attitude of paper one. We covered um, most of the important topics. Yes, few topics had to be left out because of the short span of time, because of because our exams are knocking at our door. So um, if you go through these slides and the lecture notes that I will be sharing um, at the end of the class, and also the video I will upload to the YouTube channel, you can watch it again for maximum retention and maximum understanding. Nevertheless, there is anything that any of you did not understand, I will now take questions and provide appropriate answers. So I'm closing this. I'm, stop I'm stopping the sharing of screen. And I'm stopping the recording as well.